I am unashamed. What about you? All right, welcome back to Unashamed. I'm uh, still at the Southern Lair with a house full of company, family. You know, it's interesting because um, Robertson's, not only do we love to eat and cook, but we're usually planning out a day or two or sometimes three in advance. So we got down here, Jace, our first night, my friend Eddie, who's a fisherman down here, he's a, a, a old captain for a boat a guide service down here. So we caught some uh, some red snapper and some pompano uh, down the beach, and I think he had a few redfish in there too. But he said, hey, why don't I fry some fish? I know you got family coming in. I said, oh, man, Eddie, that'd be perfect. So we figured out what time everybody was coming in, and so – so, Dad, you'll appreciate this. I kind of had a hankering back to my childhood, and so I told Lisa, I said, you know, I want to have some pinto beans with my fish because when we grew up, we always had pinto beans and with the fish. Now, I don't really know why, but that was just – we always had – so, Dad, maybe you can tell me why, but we always had a pot of pinto beans. Fish were and, easy to catch, and, and beans were cheap. Okay. No, and- <laughs> I, that's what I concluded. Because like, I remember when I thought when I was going to get married, I said, one of the things I'm going to change is I'm going to separate the beans from the fish. I'm going to make that. Yeah. We still love them, right, Jay? But oh, you just I, separate. I eat pinto beans at least once a week, but I have rice with it. And yeah. then I have, we the have cornbread. The, the cornbread, which caused a lot of controversy in our family because everyone took the same recipe and made their version of the hot jalapeno cornbread and i believe my yep. my wife won the competition but everybody believes their family won that competition which is why you have the different versions of the cornbread but then when it i even made yeah, yeah, an when, episode of the show yeah yeah when i have fish i i just i, I don't i don't I, I don't want to fill up the stomach with beans when when I have fish. So, Jace, I broke through. I broke through the old wall, so I went back. We made the beans, but we made them the sort of upgraded version, not the full with the meat and everything, just, just beans. And we had fish, and it was great. We had the chow chow, Dad. We had the pickled tomatoes. The only thing I didn't have that we had when I was growing up was the pasta and tomatoes. But I think the only reason we had that may have been, again, cheap just to fill your stomach. But I think that was because my uncles and aunts couldn't eat anything fried. And so they did that just for them. That was my guess. But I don't know. But they always used to have some like macaroni and fresh tomatoes for them. But we didn't do that. But So we had that the first night. We were already planning the next day. We had mom's meatloaf. Alex made that delicious. Perfect. Missy makes that as well. We, we've we totally got mom's recipe down for that. And then at the same time, I made uh, last night, I cooked, I smoked first and made my first Boston butt. Cooked it all night last night. I got it out this morning. And you know, you know, I was, wasn't sure. It was my first time at it. Of course, Stone makes it, you know, at home. And so I was a little nervous about it. So I took it out of the oven this morning. It's been cooking all night. I took that big fork, Dad. And so you, the big question is, when you take that fork and you go into it, what's going to happen? Because if the fork stops about halfway through, then we, we, no good. It was a bust, and so but the fork goes all the way through it, so it was it was perfect. So I I hit it again. So we're we're eating good down here in the neighborhood, as they say, for our big vacation. So that's that's one positive. All right, so I we're going to talk about we're on this. I am series what do you call it more than a metaphor because it is more than a metaphor and and we have concluded after a few podcasts about this is that if if you wanted to make a list where jesus being the i am would would make sense the list would be quite lengthy you know somebody said oh there's seven i am statements and we actually came up with nine just in the book of john but seven metaphors, as they say. But actually, it, it's an endless. Anything that happens on the earth 
you're going to make a heavenly connection. When you make a heavenly connection, you're going to go to what how we relate to God, and that's Jesus be, being created in the image of God. He John one seventeen he he has made God known. So the list could be quite lengthy, as in to the hundreds. By the way, what the, this is interesting, uh, since you hit on that, if I testify about myself, John 5, verse 37, if I testify about myself, just listen to this, my testimony is not valid. If I testify about myself, my testimony is not valid. There, There is another who testifies in my favor, and I know that his testimony about me is valid. You've sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. Not that I accept human testimony, but I mention it that you may be saved. John was a lamp that burned and gave light, and you chose for a time to enjoy his light. I have testimony weightier than that of John. For the very work that the Father has given me to finish and which I am doing testifies that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You have never heard his voice nor seen his form. We're back to the invisible God. Nor does the word dwell in you. His, nor does his word dwell in you. For you do not believe the one he sent. And then we always quote these verses for various reasons. You diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These scriptures are about me. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. I just think that. Perfect lead in because we're going to be. Lead in to the way, the, 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 what's going on there. Well, that's perfect because we're actually going to be in John 6, which. He's going to do some testifying. I'll just give you a warm up there. Through a miracle that became a sign that, which is in some Christian segments is kind of controversial and that Jesus saying, I'm the bread of life. You know, whoever feeds on me will have eternal life. People are like, oh, this is, I mean, what kind of statement is that? That That's, that's disgusting and, and just kind of creepy. But they're missing the point that, Everything in the earth is going to go back to some kind of heavenly existence. And I mean that by the person of God, not necessarily just the things. But I did something I thought was kind of interesting because I thought, well, we're going to be talking about the bread of life. And, and the point being that you're, you know, Jesus was giving you a picture, and we'll read it here in a sec, but that if you're feeding on Jesus, that will sustain you. Not just for the earth, but for eternity. I mean, that was the the spiritual. I mean, he he spoke in John six, kind of this. I have this bread for the mind, which I think he did that through the miracle. Because you think about what miracles are for, and we talked about that last time. They were to to show you a sign. What I propose of, of Jesus's character, but it's also. Uh, you know, a sign that where all this came from, you know, where did all the earthly, where, where did this stuff come from? And how can you figure out, you know, the, your purpose on earth, your, how you're getting off the earth, how you got on the earth, all these questions of life. And so he basically gives a miracle because that makes you think and ask a question, who is this Jesus? Who is this guy? Which is a great question. Every person must ask that question at some point. If you value your life and value how long you live, who is this Jesus? Because his the the statements that he made, the claims that he he came out with, they're like no claim that you will ever consider from anyone else that's ever been on the earth. Not even close. Everybody else says, look, here's some truth on how to extend life or how to go to heaven or how to, you know, be regenerated or whatever, reincarnated or, but Jesus was the only one that says, oh yeah, there's a God and you're looking at him. I became a human for you. 
when he made these claims. So, But what I did, I thought just so we consider the importance of what we put in our body when it comes to food. So I, I just did a search of the internet, top 10 consumed foods. And of course, you can imagine hundreds of things came, came up. So really there was no, you know, not every uh, poll that I looked at had the same number one, but there was one number one more than all the others, and I was shocked at what it was. Do y'all do y'all want to guess? And it's not bread because that would be too some kind convenient. of some, some kind of concoction with veggies in in them. Number one consumed food, and this was just based on me scanning several polls, and I noticed one thing was more than all the others. It was not bread. Al, do you want to give a shot? I would say corn. Now, I thought you might get it. Corn was on the list, on a lot of the list, but not number one. I thought you might get it because you you started off talking about beans. Well, you had the beans, but you didn't have the rice. 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 We eat a lot of rice. Well, now here's what was depressing. Uh, And bread was on most lists, by the way. But what was depressing is when I looked at just the U.S. only, because every global search had what you would think. Rice, uh, pasta was on there, corn, uh, chicken, just the things you would, things people eat. When I, when I did the U.S., oh, it got depressing because every list had went about like this. Burgers, apple pie, french fries, hot dogs. Look, m- uh, I was shocked at this. Chocolate chip cookies, Oreo cookies would be on the same list. Potato chips, pizza. Chicken was on there, but it was always fried. <laughs> and the only thing grilled <laughs> that I saw in the U.S. list was cheese. <laughs> I thought, no wonder we we have a, a no girth. We have a little obesity problem. <laughs> a girth problem. We call it girth. Jeff told me that the last time because you know when we're doing this show, the treasure hunting show together, they're yeah. constantly you know saying, oh, you know. Give Jep a hard time, you know, about whatever. And uh, so I'll say little funny things about his anatomy. Because, you know, in our family, we can take a joke. We can take a joke. And, uh, and he's like, hey, dude, I mean, why do, you, why do you keep bringing that up? I'm like, well, I mean, it's the obvious choice there, Jep. You've been... <laughs> <laughs> so now all you're on a show with a lot of skinny people. Yeah. What do you think they're gonna say? So the last trip uh, we took, Jeff literally just, I was like, "Oh, are you on a diet now? Am I subconsciously getting to?" He's like, "I'm not doing this because you're getting to me." He said, "I just realized, you know, if I keep this up, I may not be here much longer." <laughs> <laughs> but it was horrible to be living with a with two other guys for you know seven, eight, ten days at a time. And we're over there just because you, you get quite the appetite from treasure hunting. It, it, you're expending a lot of energy. And he's uh, he's over there, you know, eating Brussels sprouts and lettuce, and we're eating everything else. So, Jason, we were growing up, you, you slept most of your life on the couch. Is, is that correct? Am I remembering correctly? Yeah, I've been a couch man uh, for years. Of course, you know. Now, when I'm summoned to the couch, it's usually because of a snoring issue. <laughs> so, so what, you know, yeah, now, but you, you grew up, you kind of liked it. And uh, yeah. now it's more of kind of like a punishment, I guess, for or whatever uh, is going on. It's called a compromise, uh, our, Al. We're compromising. I gotcha. I gotcha. Yeah. One of our sponsors is a company called Helix Sleep, and uh, they have a fantastic uh, mattress. And uh, one of the things that uh, they've introduced to to our family is uh, is Helix for kids, and which fits me perfectly right now because I'm down here at the Southern Lair, and I have a house full of kids, and so recently they sent me uh, a Helix Twin uh, mattress for kids, 
and it worked out perfectly because I was able to bring it down here uh, because I got kids everywhere. I got kids on couches. I got kids on pallets. And so I've had quite the fight uh, for this Helix uh, for kids mattress. And so everybody's been wanting to get on it. Uh, but it was great. We, we went online. We took the little uh, quiz that you take. And so it's a firmer mattress from kids three to seven because they need that spinal support. It's a little softer uh, for kids that are eight to 12 uh, as they grow up. So there's a lot of science that goes into this, which is really fantastic. And so I want you guys to check it out. Uh, Helix Kids Mattress has been awarded the number one mattress picked by Parents Magazine. So it's really great. Right now they're offering 20% off of all mattress orders, including the Helix Kids Mattress and two free pillows for all of our listeners. So go to helixsleep.com slash unashamed. This is their best offer and it won't last long. So check them out. Helixsleep.com slash unashamed. 20% off all mattress orders, including the Helix Kids Mattress and two free pillows. Well, I just, I thought you'd find that fascinating. But man's got to eat and you are what you eat. And so I think Jesus using this metaphor because you think about that, you are what you eat. I mean, you you give it some time, and we're going to figure out what you've been getting into. And so Jesus taps into that in John 6. Now, there's actually two sections. He does the miracle, and we're, I mean, we're very familiar with this, this miracle. I think it's maybe the only one that's in all four of the Gospels. I know it's in all four of the Gospels. I'm not sure if there's another miracle that is, but I, I think it's either... There's only a couple, and this may be the only one. So 6 1 says, Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs he had performed in the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside, sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover feast was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for I already had in mind what he was going to do, which I, I, I love that he's, he's, he's come up with an idea here. Philip answered, eight months wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. I mean, so it was, it was kind of an absurd uh, question. But Jesus had a reason for that. So another one of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five barley loaves and two small fish. And I, I researched this barley loaf. It was kind of the lowest form. It was the bread for the poor people. So it's not a whole lot here. And remember that Andrew was kind of the first one on board. And it does make me think that he kind of has a, at least just a mustard seeds worth of where, you know, here's a possibility. Like, it's almost like, it's like, well, here's a guy with a little bit of, I mean, I get the impression it's like, here's some food. Can you do something with this? I mean, that's kind of how I read it. I mean, it seems absurd on both accounts. I mean, what are we going to do with this? We're going to make a bunch of people mad here. Right. But he's, I think they're more, he's more looking like, this is not going to happen. This is all we got. I mean, we might as well just go ahead and eat this kid's lunch, which is another story. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> but how funny. far will this go with so many? Jesus said, well, have them sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place. The men sat down, about 5,000. You know, now, you read this. It, it seems to imply when you get into the Greek and all, it was about 5,000 families. So... Yeah, that there's actually more than 5,000. It's 5,000 plus. Right. right. So, because the Greek, when it gets into, uh, you know, the gender thing, the, their words were a little different. So it's hard to, right. to figure that out. But in verse 11, Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, distributed to those who were seated, and uh, they did the same with the fish. So they start distributing this, which, now look, if it was me, I, I, I mean, I'm just confessing my sins even though I, I didn't commit any, I would have, because I would have said, why are we doing I would have griped and complained about this. What there's? How is this going to end well, especially when it comes to food? Because, look, if you want to see the soul of man, what do you do? Get him at the table and, and start passing out the select cuts of meat and the amounts. 
I've seen a lot of people, I mean, most of the fights that I had in my teenage years revolved around food and my brothers and portion sizes and which parts of the chicken's anatomy was distributed to who. <laughs> and who got there first and who got the most. I mean, I avoid it because I want to be transparent and I try to base everything on truth and I don't want to make up things. So I'm going to say this. I never actually had a fork stabbed into me, but it was close. I had the <laughs> attempt. There was an attempted <laughs> Fork stabbing on several occasions, and it all came from Willie. I don't think Al ever did that, but Willie did. And Jace, what about the? And even to this day, if you want to see a pretty good ranker, if you're in a vacation town, which you guys, you, you and your family go from time to time, and you're gathered around a busy restaurant at where they're taking names and when to get in, if if there's if there's an opportunity for angry people. Because of somebody's name on a list and I didn't get called when I was supposed to. And this person got ahead of me. Even to this day, there can be there can be anger and there can be gnashing of teeth even now over this type of issue. To your point, I mean, e even in a civilized society as ours over food and who gets called and who gets a table and who got here first and blah, blah, blah. No doubt. So to continue the story in verse 12. So when they had all enough to eat, when they had all had enough to eat, which you're like, wait, what? How did this happen? Gather the pieces that are left. They even had leftovers. And we don't even have to get into leftovers. I'm not a big leftover guy. Unless something like this would have happened. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the miraculous sign, now notice it said miraculous sign. I made this point on the last podcast because the point I was making was he could have done a greater miracle, even though this was fantastic. This still left some room for doubt because what are people thinking? You're not believing he actually did this, are you? You would be thinking, well, where where are they getting this bread and fit? They somebody there's the I'd be looking at tables or tents or behind some rocks. There there's a lot of bread and fish coming from somewhere that we're not real sure about, <laughs> right? You just wouldn't think. I mean, wh what could he have done if it was you? He could have just had this giant loaf, you know, descend like a spaceship, and then at the same time, a giant fish appears out of the water, and then it, like, cooks it itself. And then... <laughs> well, I'm saying, well, Jace, would that have Jace, been... Your imagination has been running overtime in the last two podcasts. <laughs> if you get my point, it will move you. I mean, it will... You will be like, he's making it a sign that he cares about people in an intimate way. Eating is something that you're going to do usually three times a day, but you're going to do it your whole life. And he's he's he cares about that. I, and you even feel this uh, sense of people that are not getting what they need to eat. He, you, you actually, he's eliciting sympathy here. And, and, and the fact that he's taking a boy that's given all he had because, I mean, you think everybody's happy except him. I mean, he, he took his lunch, you know. He probably wanted to go back and show his dad what he caught, you know. <laughs> I hope he got one of those basketballs to take back home. That's well, hopefully he did. He probably did. So you see the miraculous sign that Jesus did. They began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. So he, he did it enough to know that some are like, this is not possible. And whatever he has done here, Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. So what were the people's response to the miracle? Well, a lot of them said, oh, this guy's powerful. We could win an army with him because we wouldn't have to worry about food. I mean, yeah, what? that's the backdrop. That's crazy. So we'll yeah, skip. That's, that, that's kind of the underlying key to the whole thing. So we'll skip the 
which is another miracle where she could have said, I am the water, I am the boat, I am the wall. So uh, 40 Days for Life is uh, one of our favorite sponsors. They've been with us for a while now, and Sean Carney is a, is a good friend. And one of the things I love about Sean is not only do they have a great organization, a million volunteers in 1,500 cities, they're the largest pro-life organization in the world, uh, but they're also helping us in the argument. They, uh, Sean's written some great books about just helping us in the discussion because a lot of this is uh, is in the realm of ideas. And so, you know, this this argument's been back and forth uh, in the pro-abortion versus pro-life. And so he's he's written some great books about just how to discuss this, you know, with your friends, with your family, uh, in the workplace. And so I want you to check these guys out. Uh, they have 40 days for life of peaceful vigils uh, all around the country. Uh, they especially focus in the states where the abortion facilities are still going on, where abortion is legal. They've helped close 132 abortion facilities in America. 45% of those were in these liberal states, uh, places like San Francisco and Chicago and Seattle. Uh, so they're having success. So I want you to check out all the materials that they're offering to help you. So check out their locations, their podcast, their free magazine at 40daysforlife.com. Stay updated on what they're doing and how you can help out. That's 4040daysforlife.com. Check them out. So after he walks on the water, because they're trying to make him king by force, they found him on the other side of the lake and they said, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, I'll tell you the truth. You're looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you on him God, the Father's place to seal of appro approval. So then he, you know, they respond. Well, they asked him, well, what must we do? the works that God requires. Just tell us what to do, which is a, which is a terrible thing to say. Because why would you ask that question? We know why we ask that, because we want to know what is the minimum possible thing that I have to do to be okay. That's just the nature of man. But Jesus says the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent, which is another mind bender. The work of God is to believe in the one he sent. Well, how does that work? You know, that doesn't seem, it's kind of like an I am statement where it's a brain teaser. Because he's basically saying, I am the requirement. <laughs> you see? That's right. Which goes yep. back to our I am the law of Moses thing. Boy, I am that, the law of those Moses. Those criticizers, they just missed it. It's a good statement. So they asked him, well, what miraculous sign then will you give that we may see and believe you? What will you do? And now, here we have another record scratch moment from the human beings. He, 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 this whole thing started with a miraculous sign. And now you want another one? Which is what I said. The reason he didn't give this, this bread, you know, falling from the heaven in low form with a whale coming out of the sea and being cooked and then raining the, the cooked parts down on them is because it would have only promoted something that he was not after, which is it would have promoted them following him, but not from the heart. Not out of love, not out of understanding, but only fear. That's my opinion. But So verse 31 says, Our forefathers ate the man in the desert as written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. So they think it's tied up with that. But Jesus said, I tell you the truth. It is not Moses who's giving you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on, give us this bread. Oh, here we go. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. He who believes in me will never be thirsty. So he actually said, you know, I am the water. I mean, he had just said in John 4, you remember when the conversation, I'm the living water, whoever drinks. It's the same concept. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. 
All that the Father gives me will come to me. All that the Father gives will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. At this, the the Jews began to grumble. You're like, wait, what? Why are they grumbling? They're grumbling because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They saw it, they tasted it, and then are mad because he's, he's, he's what filled you up. See, they were making this point about Moses, which is where their trust was. You got to remember, this is Jewish audience. They're like, who do you think you are? I mean, this is the claim is so outlandish because you're claiming to be the God of heaven and earth. So they they first they want to make him king. Why? So they can take over the world from a physical realm. Israel will now take over the world because we got somebody who can make something out of the air and he can make food. There's no telling what he can do with a sword if he can do this with bread. So then they have a conversation with him, and now they're offended because he seems to be acting like he's greater than Moses. And they're like, this is sacrilegious. And they're missing the point of what he's saying because if what he's saying is true, then you need to put your faith and trust in him. He's the fulfillment of the law of Moses. He is the fulfillment of prophecy. I mean, he's he's better than whatever you thought you had. Yeah, I want the bread, but I don't want I don't want you. I don't want the man. That's what was what they're saying. Because then they said, "Is this not the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he say I came down from heaven?" In other words, again, they can't see him. He he can't be an I am, but then they can't explain how he could do what he did. It's the same old cycle that they keep running themselves in. Yeah, exactly. And uh, and basically, he's saying, "I am the miracle." Right. That's what they're they're looking at what he can do, and but they're not connecting that. Which, look, we weren't there. And and it's hard for the human to believe. I mean, I'm skeptical about anything, just by, by nature, especially things that are not aligning with the laws of nature. And I mean, so I think you have that because if this is true, this changes. This should change everything. Your your belief system, your heritage, your plan moving forward. I mean, that that's the nature of this. And so I thought of this, you know, in the in the message he sent to John the Baptist to go into that that Jesus cares not only I mean, he was doing miracles that shows that he cares about people. I mean, you remember what he said uh in I think it's Matthew eleven. Matthew eleven, four five, four and five. Just to give you the picture of that, these miracles not only were a, a demonstration of power. Yeah, when he when he he replied, uh, "Go back and report to John what you hear and see: the blind receive the sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me." Well, why would he bring up six issues here, all revolving around suffering, uh, injustice, uh, status of people? I mean, he brings up the poor, the you know people who can't hear, uh, people that have died, all these things, people that are blind, people that have diseases. What does that cause in our society? All of these th- things cause pain and suffering and anxiety and tears and mourning and grieving. And so Jesus is doing these miracles. 
to give you something way bigger than a meal. Right. And, and we need meals, you know, to sustain us. And so I think that's the part that I find uh, the most inspiring is that he's not only just there's there's a there's a lot of variables going on. He's not only claiming to be the son of God and then showing the power that he has. He's also showing an underlying current that he cares about people, that he wants to do this the right way, that he has a plan for you. He wants to change the world socially, uh, economically. Uh, he, he's just turning the whole world upside down right in front of their eyes. And he also doubles down, though, Jay's. So, so they're 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 wavering here in this moment. But watch what he does. So twice he's going to double down, but he's going to take it sharper because he says he tells them, "Quit grumbling amongst yourself." And he drops down in, four, in verse forty six. He says, "No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only only he has seen the Father." I tell you the truth: He who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. He says it again. Your forefathers ate the man in the desert, yet they died. So now he's saying, look, it's way more than the bread. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, uh uh-oh, which I will give for the life of this world. And now... He's taking it to another level. He's saying, "This you must eat of my flesh to live forever. So he's now taking them to another level to grasp. And, of course, the next verse says, they begin to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And so that's where, you know, even through the centuries after this context, you know, cannibalism. I mean, there's been, like you said earlier, there's been all sorts of controversy around this concept and this idea about what Jesus was talking about here. But I, I like it that he's going to take it. He doesn't like try to ease up and say, now, look, you, you know, let me try to, let me try to lighten this understanding of what I mean by saying I am the living bread. What he says is no, I am literally the living bread. And I think by doing that, he's given them a sign, not with just this miracle, but all the other ones in the letter that I read about to John the Baptist is he's, actually given a thought that people don't address is he saying the world doesn't have to be like this it doesn't have to be broken you know that this is this is what gets me about people who deny jesus as the son of god because when they when you what what have you what are you left with without jesus you're left with a broken world and there's no, there's no, uh, there's no alternative. Here comes Jesus doing these miracles, these signs that are historically documented, and he's actually giving you an idea that as a human, you, you're never going to find on the earth anywhere else. And the idea is, it doesn't have to be this way. You just think about every miracle that he did; it was some aspect of brokenness, pain that was relieved. And so, to me, that alone, just when you pile all the miracles up for the reason, shows you, you know what, there's a, there's a way to renovate the whole spiritual aspect of society when it comes to pain, suffering, injustice, being poor, you know, being homeless. You know, it's a, it's a thought here. It's not about just you know a meal. And I, he's he's taking this to another level that is almost beyond what we can grasp. But if you put all his miracles into one big basket, that's what you're going to find. It's it's relieving basic human necessities, brokenness, pain of you know. Conflict. I mean, if you're, you're everybody's fine when they're being well fed now, but when you get hungry, all of a sudden we got a problem here. What what's wrong with this this place? Because unfortunately, I don't know what the homeless rate is and the uh, those that are that are without food. But it would probably surprise you to see that it's a number. lot. It's a lot. Yeah. 
So my point is he's addressing himself as being one who can sustain you mentally, because he's making you think, uh, physically. That is an aspect. Now, they took it the wrong way. They, they're like, oh, we need to make him king. We need to go conquer the world because he can take care of our physical needs. You know, they, they missed it. But also of the heart, which is what you were just referring to, Al, the spiritual ramifications of this are, are off the charts. If he is who he said he was. You said it, Jace. It's the, it's the temporary and the, and the uh, earthly versus the eternal. And that becomes the whole thing because it was back where we started the podcast. You know, you can, when you eat a fine meal and you're full and you're thinking, man, uh, that was just so delicious and so good. I mean, even before you can even just fully enjoy that, you start realizing in your mind that, you know what, in about eight hours, I'm going to be hungry again. I mean, I'm not even fully enjoying what I just ate, but I realize I'm going to get hungry again. It's the nature of being a human being on earth. Exactly. It's just, it's never fulfilling. And so that's the point he's making. You know, when, when God was sending the manna down and later the quail, it was in the, in the temporary human nature of things, it doesn't, I mean, the, the next day they're hungry again. What he's saying is I'm offering you something that's far greater than the temporary fulfillment of your stomach. I'm offering you something that's forever. I'm offering yeah. you something that, that that's going to fulfill you beyond just an eight hour temporary. My stomach's full and it was a fine meal. This is something greater. And they were just having a hard time wrapping their mind around it because they could only see in the temporary conquering of what they had. Yeah, that's what I was getting at. If this world is all there is and there's no God, then just take all the injustice and all the brokenness and all the all the physical challenges that people have. Well, that, that's all just natural. Look, if there's no these, God, look, and then there's no answer. All these drugs and all of these things that our culture and that culture participate in by feeding on that, uh, whether it's the rehabs, the hospital rooms, the one, the prisons, it, it just goes on and on and on. It's just a lot of unhappy individuals. They're eating the wrong food. They're eating the wrong food. And look, so when you think about this, was he trying to come up with a religious plan or, or was he, you know, what was the sign? You know, signs point to something. So here he does this, and we read all that on purpose because it helps you understand you know, the context of him making this statement, I am the bread of life. But I want you to notice something. In, in John 6, going back to John 6, if you read where I left off, the last section I read, 34 through 40, watch how many times he says I or me. In this, so when he says in verse thirty-five, then Jesus declared, "All right, I am the bread of life." But he continues this: "He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believe in me. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All that all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never." All right, it's, I think you're going to get to multiple times. He's trying to say, you're look, there is a God, and you're looking at him. Body, soul, and spirit will be perfectly fine. This is the earth, the way it is run is not natural. There, It's become this way because of man's sin. There's evil in the world. You're perishable. He's come to relieve all that. It's it's so when you read the John five, it was a perfect lead in, even though we didn't discuss it. Because here's a group of people who believe in God. They have a heritage based on the old law, and he had just chastised them. Same group saying, "You think that by these scriptures you're going to possess eternal life, but you refuse to come to me." And he's declaring that the God of the universe has come to earth. He is a man. His name is Jesus. 
You're looking at him. And he's showing these miracles and signs. But what I love about it is he's doing it always in practical ways that are the answers to all of Earth's problems. He's not doing it in some kind of sideshow with, you know, Hollywood graphics of all these crazy things that we think we want and these things that we think are going to answer the world's problems. He is he's embodying that. He's he is the bread of life. He is the door. He is the gate. It, it's going to get more intimate as we go along. You know, he knows the sheep by name. He is the resurrection. He is the life. You put you start stacking all these things together and you're like, "Well, what what's my whole, what what am I sitting here on the sidelines for?" He literally has come, come down in pursuit of me, found me and said, "Here's every reason in the world to follow me." I want to read this uh, last section. Uh, we just got a little bit of time left before we get to overtime because he he doubles down one more time. And I want to discuss it here at the end and then also in our overtime because he's going to bring another element in. And to me, this must have blown their minds because already they're struggling in this context to understand. And then he's going to bring one more element into the picture after they're saying, how can he, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then he says this in verse 53. I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man. So that's they're trying to put their heads around that. Now he says, and drink his blood, you have no life in you. So now he's added an element of his blood into it. And, of course, we know what that means looking back, but they, of course, have no idea in the moment. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate man and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum, which we know remember was a place where they were having a hard time accepting him anyway. Remember it was in Capernaum. So now he brings in the concept of the blood, which of course would be the blood of the covenant, you know, blood of the lamb, the the whole idea of the Passover and all the concepts are going to go along with that. But I just I, I like in this context he doesn't hold back on the full concept of these sort of spiritual concepts brought out of a physical construct. You know, it's the idea they understood blood and they understood sacrifice. I mean, every Jewish mind got it, but now he's putting it in his context, like because yeah. he is divine. I mean, he, he just gave them the whole package in yesterday, one conversation. Yesterday we drank his blood and ate his flesh. That's right. Uh, the brothers were there. We stopped and that was right in the middle of the service. But it's pretty incredible that that's still there, Al. After 2,000 well, years, after you're still think practicing. He made, he, the transition happened after what we read. You know, when the Jews in verse 41, and I mean transition in that he went from appealing to their minds with doing the miracle, appealing to their flesh, which is we do need food, just, I mean, they were hungry, and he fed them physically. That happened, and then, but what happened? They got the wrong idea. They started following him around because evidently the fish and bread that he was making out of heaven was good, and they wanted some more of it. I mean, this was the primo meal because now he's like, y'all are just following me around because you want some more of that fish yeah. and bread. They they but, they, they translated his, his goodness into a firepower. Well, because <laughs> I think it was good, but. And that's what people do, you know. They, if you feed people, and which we've all done, we've invited people to our homes, and we cook them the best, and we share Jesus at that meal. Well, there, there is a uh, unfortunately a certain percentage of people who will keep coming to hear that Jesus sermon just so they can eat that meal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't want to get into that. Well, that's the way. Well, this is what happened <laughs> to is, Jesus. It is true. <laughs> but he made a transition to the part about eating his body and flat, the, the controversial part of this. And I'm saying that happened in 41 
when they, because they got mad when he said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, well, verse 42, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can you say I came down from heaven? So they're, because they're making this physical, they're, well, we know you. The same that happened in the chosen and when they did, concluded, when he said, I am the law of Moses, same thing happened right here. They're like, no, we know this guy. You're not from heaven. You can't make, I don't know how the what the trick is here, but you're not who you're claiming to be. Now watch what Jesus said. He said, stop grumbling among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I'll raise him up at the last day. Well, all of a sudden, he transitioned it into this, the spiritual side of things, talking about the father drawing him. Well, what is that? Well, the only thing I could conclude, and I'd be interested to hear your thoughts, is that we all have this spiritual hunger in us, all of us. There, there's a, all of us can see creation and be on the earth, and we know right from wrong. We know that there's got to be more than this. Are you telling me this is natural, that the whole world's broken and 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 evil triumphs and no there's got to be something more we have a spiritual hunger we all as human beings have this hunch about us that there's something more to this whether it comes by creation or the spiritual side of things or realizing good and evil the need for love and so i think that's why when he got to that section that he was planting that seed that you you you've noticed something is wrong with this picture, and here I am. I've I've come to clear that up for you, and I'm the way. So when he makes this analogy about eating his flesh and blood, it, it's a spirit. The spiritual connotations of doing that. Yes, we do feed on Jesus, and His blood is going to clean us up. But it's not going to be our power. It's going to be His. That was basically what he was transitioning into. Is what I think. You're right. You're right on that, Jace. I think so, too. And uh, <clears throat> we'll talk a little bit more, more about that, as well as the, as Dad brought up, the modern implications of that, because we still practice this, as he instituted on the, the night before his death, uh, with this idea about the Lord's Supper and Communion. So we'll talk about that a little bit in the overtime segment, because uh, we're out of time. If you want to follow us over, it's blazetv.com slash unashamed. As we continue talking about the more than a metaphor, I am statements uh, out of John and possibly a few other places, because uh, I guess you could say not only I am the bread of life, Chase, but I am the blood of Christ or I am the blood uh, as well. So we found another one. So we'll see you in overtime. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes and don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube And be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.